Normally, when people hear the term state forest, certain images come to mind. But is the particular tract of land really different from a stretch of forest that's not a publicly protected domain? In efforts to understand state protected land, I came across Earlville State Forest. The area was developed during the late 1920s when the effects of the Great Depression caused the state of New York to purchase former farmland. Since its formation in 1929, the parcel has been a prominent feature in Madison County. Consisting of 634 acres, the site is located in the town of Lebanon. It is here that songbirds stop to rest during their fall migration and where hunters gather to seek deer, turkey, and gray squirrel. On the surface, there really isn't a notable difference from privately owned property, but a closer look reveals the forest complexity. From its ability to capture the interests of the local Audubon Society, to the snowmobiling roads it features each winter. As I tried to uncover the aspects hidden behind the rows of trees, a few questions kept coming to mind. Are state forests wilder than, let's say, the Colgate Ski Hill? Than my backyard? What makes a state forest a state forest? What does the distinction really mean? Finally, is it really natural? My efforts to answer these questions took me through the Madison County countryside and gave me the opportunity to meet the people that live in and around Hamilton. It was they that allowed me to realize that the definition of Earlville State Forest, a single piece of unassuming property hidden away in the foothills of Madison County, has several facets. For the last couple of years, we've been doing uh, surveys of the fauna in forests at the Earlville State Forest for a couple of purposes. One has been to provide re uh, reference areas for our work that's going on in the Adirondacks related to acid rain. And secondly, to contribute in a modest way toward understanding the effects of different kinds of silvicultural treatments. So they have recently thinned a couple uh, forest tracts. And so we studied those tracts before they did the thinning and then after they did the thinning and some areas that were not thinned in the last few years of similar forest types. Well, we've been looking at a couple different groups that reside at the forest floor in sort of moist forest floor habitats. Among those are shrews. It's a group of small insectivorous mammals. They tend to be pretty good indicators of forest floor health in the sense of um, uh, having a healthy understory uh, herbaceous or uh, ground level vegetation layer um, as well as um, have high nutrient content and calcium content in the soil. They tend to be pretty good indicators of that. We've also been looking at earthworms. Um, the majority of the earthworm species in our landscape are exotic species and the different species have different acid tolerances and different um, associations with with in, uh, very disturbed sites or very pristine sites and so we're very interested to see whether some of those more pristine uh, pristine site earthworms might might occupy the um, more mature plantation forests at the Earlville State Forest because some of those plantations are quite old actually. So all of those state reforestation areas tend to have a high percentage of intensively managed forest types, in particular conifer plantations. So it, at the Earlville State Forest, there's a lot of Norway spruce plantations. Norway spruce isn't native to North America, so obviously that's, that's kind of an artificial forest type in our landscape. It's not all that uncommon, though, because after a lot of agricultural land was abandoned in the early part of the 20th century, a lot of it went to conifer plantations, and quite a few Quite a few of those were established with Norway spruce, uh, whereas the forests around here tend to be managed a little sloppier, and, which is better for forest floor wildlife. I am the coordinator and the count compiler for the Sherburne Area Christmas Bird Count. And uh, one of the, the things that we uh, really appreciate having in this area is lots of state forest land and uh, the Earlville State Forest is very important for certain species of birds that we find in the wintertime that are only found in large forested tracts. And so there are quite a few, especially in the wintertime, uh, birds that are found uh, in uh, the large forest areas, uh, those that are planted with evergreens especially. Some of the Norway spruce trees are very large evergreen trees 
And uh, those trees in particular attract certain species of birds, particularly golden crown kinglets, uh, black-capped chickadees, red-breasted nuthatches, goldfinches, and other winter finches that we find um, occasionally in the wintertime, like red poles and uh, white-winged crossbills, red crossbills, pine grosbeaks, pine siskins, evening grosbeaks. And uh, some of those birds we, we seldom see. They only may come down to this area, say, every five years or so, once every five years. But the places where we find them are the large tracts of state forest land that have lots of evergreen trees. So uh, very important that we have those, those forests with the plantations of evergreen trees on them. We've been managing up there recently uh, for uh, some open areas which would attract uh, different types of animals and the rough grouse would be one of those that's attracted to uh, semi-open uh, sorts of areas. Often, it may be the only place we get certain species. Uh, there might be a couple of woodpeckers that we get there and no place else. Uh, the golden crown kinglet I've had there and no place else. Red-breasted nuthatch I've had there and no place else. So very important to uh, have a place like that where we can document that those birds are in the area because nobody else on that the Christmas count day, nobody else may see them. So uh, very important to have that spot. Well, uh, a lot of people, uh, I have a background in forestry and I've studied, you know, outdoor recreationists to an extent, and a lot of people are out there just for the experience, uh, a variety of experiences, but it's, it's one way that people uh, get to relate to nature and they see the outdoors. And, and uh, the, speed, the, the, the speed thing has slowly diminished over the years, as now there's a state imposed speed limit of 55 miles an hour, which is more of a safety factor than anything else. But typically uh, on a nice day, uh, I, I like to just go along at 20, 25 miles an hour and tool through the woods and you know, watch the birds and the animals from a distance. You know, we, all snowmobiles are encouraged to stay on the trail so that they don't uh, interfere with the you know, wildlife. When we say manage, uh, forest management, uh, again, it's, it's guided by those two important principles of, uh, of growth and regeneration. So, well, I'm responding to the different users. I think as a professional, or as a manager, a professional manager of, of, of forest land, public forest land, I'm trying to identify what the public good is, what public interest there is in these properties. So how I see it differently, oftentimes the recreationalist is, is interested in recreation, where the guy who's harvesting timber is interested in the timber, or the uh, people who live downstream are interested to make sure there's no dirt in the stream as it flows off the forest. I try to look at all of these different values and try to, and understand the values that these different people have, different communities have, and incorporate that into the management. They definitely have more character because they're, they're bigger, number one, so they're more wild. And it's just a better feeling when you're in there. Because like you're really in the woods, you don't hear the cars and the kids screaming and yelling. And what are you offering you? I can see. I can see. Mm -hmm. And uh, how long have you been doing that? About 48 years. <laughs> I do like the silence, the feeling, peace for the better, better, lack of a better word. <laughs> there's quite a lot of wildlife if you get back in, which is another reason that I like it, as opposed to just woods that, like around my house, because I have three acres with woods. But you don't generally run into deer and other animals that if you're quiet and you're just out there walking along. Now see, that's a hard one. I can see why you would want to thin, thin out the woods so it doesn't get totally overgrown. But then when you go to the places where they have been cutting, it looks awful and all the sounds are gone and the birds aren't there. And I can see both sides of it. But. Personally, if it wasn't from a financial point of view, I wish they wouldn't do it at all. 
I definitely think that I'm romantic about the, the feelings that I have for it. And because I wanted to live off the land, and I did that for a while out in the woods. And that was the best time of my whole life. We had no running water, no electric, and we just lived out there.